Please like, subscribe, comment, and share. I really believe you'll do it. Because I really believe that you love me. When you bring up Twin Peaks in conversation, and someone has passing familiarity with the show, the non-fan will usually say something like, that's who killed Laura Palmer, right? It's like who killed Laura Palmer was the unofficial title of the show. That's the only way the clunky syntax makes sense. The investigation into the murder of Laura Palmer was supposed to be the central focus of the show. Good Lord, Laura. Laura Palmer. When the network forced David Lynch to reveal the killer prematurely, they essentially destroyed the show and all Twin Peaks after that episode, good or bad, was an attempt to reconcile the continuation of a story with the arrival of its logical conclusion. But this essay is not about that. This essay is about the first 15 episodes of the original series and about three quarters of the film, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. This is about what Twin Peaks was supposed to be about, an investigation into the death and life of that most Lynchian protagonist, a woman in trouble. There was no ambiguity about Lynch's approach to the murder mystery. The murder of Laura Palmer was never supposed to be solved. That is um, this beautiful little goose. Mm -hmm. And the little goose is laying golden eggs. Mm -hmm. And why would you kill this little <laughs> goose? That mystery was sacred. And it held the other ones. It was the tree, and the other ones were the branches. So the identity of the killer was never the central mystery. Lynch wanted the investigation of the murder to uncover important truths about violence, media, and society. Golden eggs. Did Twin Peaks do this? Did Lynch have a different ending in mind? If Lynch's intended resolution was never realized, can we deduce what it might have been? Did the events of Twin Peaks' fire walk with me give us the Lynchian resolution he wanted, or was it all post hoc improvisation? We'll try to answer these questions and others. So go get yourself a damn fine cup of coffee with try a slice of that pie and a side order of. <laughs> Let me repeat what I said about Laura's defining trait. Laura does things that other characters want. She even goes as far as to become things they want her to be. You want sex? Laura will have sex with you. You want food? Laura will bring you food. If you want to collect other people's stories, Laura will bring you her story. Your special needs son needs help? Laura will do it and apparently have the expertise to do it. English is your second language? Laura will tutor you. You're a good boy who wants a good girl? Laura will be that. You're a bad boy who wants a bad girl? Laura will be that. You want a best friend? Laura will be that. You want the perfect daughter, the perfect student, the perfect homecoming queen? Laura will be that. And if you want a murder mystery, Laura will be killed for you. Look at this scene. Laura is with Donna, so she's being the wholesome best friend. Bobby confronts her, and she throws a mean-spirited insult at him. Where were you for the last hour? I've been looking all over for you. I was standing right behind you, but you're too dumb to turn around. She turns to Donna and reframes the insult as some good-natured ribbing. If you turned around, you might get dizzy. <laughs> Bobby is mean and she's giving back as good as she gets. Bobby threatens to cut off her supply of cocaine. You'll be calling soon and maybe I won't be around. And she transforms into a sort of good girl. Come on, Bobby. Come on. But this is a cruelly manipulative act, meaning that she is the bad girl impersonating the good girl. This is distinct from the good girl she is around Donna. Donna is speechless. Love you, babe. Laura spins around, transforming from the bad girl pretending to be a good girl to an unironic bad girl, and then isolated with Donna, she is the carefree good girl again. Look at her work as a prostitute. It's true that a lot of underage girls are forced into sex work, but Laura seems to be sort of cool with what should be an abusive relationship. She doesn't need the money, and Jacques doesn't seem to have any control over her. It's also true that real young women with agency will sometimes do nothing to resist their abusers, but Laura seems to be kind of okay with Bob. At the very least, it's inconsistent. Most of the time she's tormented, but you have to account for that and all the times that she seems to be into it. She states in no uncertain terms that she got sexually aroused by a prior attempt to murder her. I think a couple of times he's tried to kill me. As you know, I sure got off on it. Isn't sex weird? Laura is almost a parody. She doesn't merely do drugs, she does all the drugs. She doesn't merely get abused by bad men, she gets abused by all the bad men. She doesn't merely love people, she loves them with radiant ecstasy. Real women who were the victims of trauma in their youth identify with Laura. There is at least one collection of their stories, Laura's Ghost, Women Speak Out About Twin Peaks. 
Perhaps Laura's bizarre behavior reminds them of the irrational things they would do under duress. I'll never understand this kind of trauma, and I would certainly never minimize their experiences, but you cannot draw a straight line from reality to the actions of Twin Peaks characters. But let's get back to the creepy tapes that Laura leaves for Jacoby. Jacoby is getting off on them. After Laura's death, she exists as entertainment for him on media. Harold Smith gets the complex prosaic Laura in his books. Laura exists as entertainment on media. James has a videotape of Laura being a fun girl. She exists as entertainment on media. Cooper wants a murder mystery, so now the video has clues, as if it changes its nature depending on the audience. Certain characters represent different kinds of audiences, and Laura exists for them. Jacoby represents harmless weirdos who want dark, perverted trash. Look at how Jacoby reacts to Laura's death. Laura's death is in line with her status as a character in a dark, perverted, trashy story, so he's not exactly broken up about it. Terrible. Terrible tragedy. Yes. Harold represents the more literate audience. James represents naive men who want pleasant stories about happy girls. Leland represents something darker. Harold refuses to give the secret diary over to the police. If that's evidence, shouldn't we give that to the sheriff? No. The complex story he enjoys would become a pedestrian murder mystery if the book became evidence. He resists. There are no solutions here. She gave it to me, a sort of living novel. When he can resist no more, he kills himself. If the entertainment product he likes ceases to exist, the audience doesn't exist, so the avatar for this kind of audience has no more place in the story. Jacoby goes on to be a content creator. He creates dark, trashy, perverted content. James goes on to be a content creator, and he makes a saccharine song about a happy couple. Donna and Maddie, who have similar roles as Laura's, happily sing along with him, almost competing for his affection. Am I saying that Laura has no story arc? No. She seems to start as this unliving thing and become something else. Almost a gender-swap Pinocchio who becomes a real girl, if Pinocchio was murdered at the end of his story. What changes Laura? Like all of Lynch's stories, we need to look at dreams. This final image from Fire Walk With Me seems easy to decode. Laura's in the afterlife. An angel is there. She's achieved some kind of grace after all of her torment. However, I think that Rossiter's interpretation makes much more sense. A light flickers on her face and an angel appears to her. Lara looks into the light and begins to laugh. What is the magical light? How about the light on someone's face when they're watching TV? Lara is watching TV and nodding with the understanding of the cosmic joke that she is a literal TV character who wouldn't even exist had it not been for the show about her own murder. This is called diegetic awareness, the attribute of a fictional character having knowledge about the fictional world in which they exist. The last seven days of Laura Palmer's life is the story of Laura gaining diegetic awareness. In my video on Lost Highway, I argue that the Fred Madison character is gaining diegetic awareness, and I further argue that oftentimes the characters can see the movie that they're in. Lynch often communicates this by having two sequential shots, the movie and the movie inside a smaller frame. In Lost Highway, Dick Laurent is watching the movie in which she exists on a portable television, and the next shot is that exact same image that was on the TV. Remember, this was before digital devices. There's no camera on that thing. In Inland Empire, the protagonist looks at a movie screen and sees herself, but specifically sees the exact next shot of herself. In Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, Laura looks at this picture in a frame, meaning that it is a prop in a movie, and then sees the exact same image without the literal frame, but rather it is a metaphorical frame of the movie that she is in. This means that it is a motion picture and not a still picture, so the camera moves. The picture of the door is the means by which Laura Palmer gains diegetic awareness. Laura is now seeing the movie that she's in. In my video on Lost Highway, I argue that Fred is no longer subject to boundaries that are imposed by the diegesis, so he can walk out of the movie and into the studio where the movie is being shot. The same thing is happening here. I will make the case that this creepy location is the backstage of the movie in which Laura Palmer exists. First, she sees the location without any context, but next she sees it as a location that coexists with the Palmer house. In the return, we will see this creepy series of rooms again, and this confirms that this is part of the labyrinth of locations outside the diegesis. Here's how the second part of the sequence begins. Laura notices the door. Why? How is it important? Well, she goes to the door and opens it, and she sees the hallway that should be there. This is the hallway of the Palmer House. 
So far, nothing strange has happened. If we think of the Palmer house as being a set, this cutaway would have been shot in another location at another time. It is only connected to Laura's bedroom through the illusion of filmmaking that we and Laura experience. What if she stops experiencing this illusion? She will cease to see her bedroom as a real location and experience it as artifice. Laura turns around to see the picture. Now she's in the picture. This image comes from the camera that is outside of her door. In two more shots, the film will cut to this camera, but it exists before we see its feed. Laura did not initially see this environment through the door because she had no diegetic awareness and therefore she sees what is supposed to be there. Now she has diegetic awareness, so if she turns around, she will be in and see herself in the backstage of the bedroom set. We get closer and the bedroom set is now gone. On the opposite side of the creepy door, a red curtain is visible. The red curtain represents backstage because film theaters and live theaters often have a red curtain. Remember that if you go to the edge of the stage or diegesis in Twin Peaks, there's a red curtain that leads to backstage. This is why I'm so impatient with the people who deny the meta-ness of Twin Peaks. Oftentimes it's really obvious. See you at the curtain call. The same time that Laura gains the power to see what is currently happening in the movie, she can see what will happen in the movie. This is why she sees Annie Blackburn as she exists three months in the future. Laura can see the parts of the film that haven't happened yet. Annie talks to her directly. Why? Well, Annie must have diegetic awareness because she was abducted and forced into the Red Room, meaning that she was backstage and therefore forced to confront that she's a fictional character. This gives her an opportunity to send a message into the past in order to save Cooper. How does she know that Laura is watching her at this exact moment? She can see parts of the film that have already happened. Sarah Palmer is often considered psychic because of her visions, but really she's just able to see the TV show she is in, even if the camera is looking at things she could not realistically see. This is why she sees Jacoby steal the half of the necklace. What other objectively impossible things does Laura see? What about the angel disappearing? Once we establish that the picture of the door can become the movie, it's a simple matter for the picture of the angel to become the movie. When we see the frame, it's a prop in a movie. When we don't see the frame, it's a frame of the motion picture. I guess anything can happen now that the painting is a movie, anything involving change over time, so the angel disappears. Let me be clear, in these two shots the framing is only slightly different. But in one shot we cannot see the literal frame, so it is a frame of the motion picture. In the next shot we can see the literal frame, so the picture is a prop within the motion picture, and that's why no more animation happens. Note that this slight difference is very meaningful. With the knowledge that she's a fictional character, Laura starts to question her very existence. First, it's small things. I'll meet you in 15 minutes. God, why did I say that? 15 minutes? <sighs> Laura is starting to question the logic of the screenplay, and she is just coming to understand that her words come from a script. This earlier scene is a series of flashbacks. Or is it? Are we seeing Laura's memories, or are we seeing those moments of the film happening a second time? It doesn't matter, since in real life these scenes are put into the movie as flashbacks, literally running that piece of film a second time. So you may as well say that Laura can summon earlier scenes from the film into playing. It is during this series of flashbacks that Laura realizes that Teresa's ring, Mike's ring, and the dwarf's ring were the same. The same ring. This triggers flashing blue light, identical to the enlightenment that the angel brings. Laura now has a certain control over the story. When she remembers something that happened in the past, the picture cuts to that scene. Bobby killed a guy. Do you want to see? See what? Right. Laura is offering to show James a clip from earlier in the film, but James doesn't have diegetic awareness, so he doesn't know what she's talking about. And Laura determines how absurd the offer was by James's confusion. Laura said a lot of nutty stuff. Half the time, it just went right by you. This simple exchange is one of the most mind-blowing scenes in the movie. Every time Laura puts the pieces together, she gets closer to understanding that she is a character in a TV show. This is Laura's journey. The reason why the nature of the owl ring is so vexing is that there doesn't seem to be any consistent rules. The most obvious thing we can deduce is that Laura is killed because she puts the ring on. Remember, Bob's original goal wasn't to kill Laura, but to possess her. For some reason, the ring blocks him, and in stopping his plan, Laura prompts her own murder. Why would Mike toss the ring to Laura? I guess Mike wanted to stop Bob from possessing her, but why? Is Mike the good guy? He doesn't try to stop Bob. He doesn't try to save Laura. Maybe he'll help Ronette. Mike? You gonna... no? Okay then. Let's look at this earlier scene. We see Leland, and then we see earlier events. 
The grammar of film would tell us that we are seeing memories from Leland's point of view. But when Leland walks away, we continue to follow the events of the three girls, even though Leland did not witness this. We have switched from Leland's point of view to an omniscient narrator. And there's the omniscient narrator. Pierre, the creepy mask boy, shows up right when the point of view changes. Outside of Leland's gaze, Teresa now has an external existence. At the end of this scene, we dissolve from this shot of Laura to a nearly identical shot from earlier, when Leland saw her. That's a very strange thing to do, dissolve from one shot to a nearly identical shot. You'd get yelled at by the professor if you did this in film school. However, Lynch felt that we had to transition back from the omniscient narrator to Leland's point of view, or we can't cut back to Leland. It is during this scene that Teresa obtains the ring. This is also the time that Teresa understands the identity of her client, and that's a very important plot point. I assume that sex work is anonymous. I have no direct experience with it. So Leland's identity is kept a secret from Teresa, and Lynch really wants us to know that. What are you doing? Who am I? I don't know. That's right. Leland is anonymous, but look at this. Teresa Banks. Teresa uses her real name? That's very strange, but it's consistent. When we see Laura beginning a transaction, this guy presumably uses a fake name. What did you say your name was? Buck. <laughs> but Laura said this. So you wanna fuck the homecoming queen? <laughs> they know who Laura Palmer is. She's not an anonymous sex worker. She's the well-known homecoming queen, Laura Palmer. In the TV show, it is implied, but not directly stated, that Ronette Pulaski is listed under her real name. Why this one-sided anonymity? It is because TV viewers can see performers, but not vice versa. The John is the audience, and the girl is the character. If you are engaging with fiction, you are the ultimate voyeur. You can see everything that's happening, but they can't see you. There is a comfort in this. Conversely, there is a profound discomfort in that power balance shifting. One of the scariest images in the history of cinema is a young woman coming out of a television. As soon as we see Teresa, not in terms of her relationship with Leland, but on her own terms, hanging out with her girlfriends, semi-independent, flush with cash, happy, her very nature changes. Does the ring appear on your finger when you gain diegetic awareness? That would make sense. As Laura slowly gains diegetic awareness, it seems that when she chooses to be a murder victim, she has reached the height of that awareness. Laura puts the ring on in order to prevent her possession by Bob because she chooses to be aware, even though it means dying. What about Annie Blackburn? She came into possession of the ring when she was in the Red Room. We don't know if it was put on her or if she put it on, but she must have gained diegetic awareness. She was backstage. So is that it? The ring is like the red pill from The Matrix or the red pill from Total Recall? It expands your consciousness? Well, yes, but there are a lot of characters who gain diegetic awareness who never come into contact with the ring, so that's an incomplete answer. Laura becomes a murder victim when she puts on the ring. A murder mystery story needs a victim, right? Teresa is also a murder victim, but more importantly, she's a blackmailer. She tries to blackmail Leland, and this prompts Leland to murder her. Think about how many murder mysteries you've seen. Maybe a third of them start with the future murder victim trying to extort the future murderer. I ran that picture in every scandal sheet, in every newspaper, on every TV news show. Give me a few hours. You got the film? Good. Why'd you bring me here? Annie Blackburn was created after Lynch left the show, and I don't think that Lynch really likes this stock girlfriend character. So, The Ring, and her status as a character in Twin Peaks, is taken away from her. We never see Annie Blackburn again. However, Annie came into possession of The Ring when she was abducted, and the protagonist has to drop everything to rescue her. She transformed from the generic girlfriend into a damsel in distress whose predicament prompts a descent into a strange underworld. The murder victim, the blackmailer, the damsel in distress. Wearing the owl ring makes you a stock murder mystery character. Specifically, you are now a character whose actions advance the plot of Twin Peaks. The ring is worn by the women who are responsible for the instigating events that keep the story going. The dwarf says this when he shows off the ring. What is this? Ring. Ah, he, what? The inset gem is Formica, carved out of a Formica tabletop, which was popular in the U.S. in the mid-20th century. Rossiter suggests that, since Formica was created as an electric insulator, and the ring looks like gold, a conductor, 
And since Mike states that a gold ring represents the repetition of the one and done murder mystery, Bob and I, when we were killing together, there was this, this perfect relationship, appetite, satisfaction, a golden circle, a golden circle, a ring. Then the gem disrupts this cycle. The owl symbol has come to represent Twin Peaks the show, so the owl ring is the embodiment of Twin Peaks changing the nature of television from a medium of cyclical violence to a medium of Lynch's positive work. Perhaps Lynch has delusions of grandeur, but more likely this is an aspirational metaphor. This is Lynch's dream, but the real guy, David Lynch, knows that this is absurd. I hope. Wearing the ring means that you are metaphorically married to the avatars of TV, Mike and the Dwarf. It's not about literal marriage, it's about commitment. These women are committed to making Twin Peaks happen. Mike appears to be in charge of the ring. In The Return, we see that he returns the ring to its proper place in the Red Room. However, after Teresa's death, the ring remains in the diegesis. It is underneath the trailer and on a pile of dirt, identical to the pile of dirt that Leland slash Bob made in the train car after the murder of Laura. Leland slash Bob put clues on the mound so it's reasonable to assume that he put the ring on the first mound as a clue for the investigator Chester Desmond and later Dale Cooper. We are curious about this obvious MacGuffin, so our avatars are equally curious. I consider this to be a sort of secondary reason for the ring. It is interesting looking, therefore we are interested in it, and getting our attention is an end unto itself. Why does Bob leave behind clues? Bob doesn't merely thrive on violence and misery. He thrives on attention. He does things that make us pay attention to him without regard for plot logic. We know it was Bob who was responsible, and this keeps our interest on his work, which further powers him because we want to see his serial killer mystery play out. And so Bob gets to consume our attention. He steals the attention away from Mike and his arm. Oh, 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 oh. Mike has the ring in this scene where he confronts Leland, meaning that he is confronting Bob. Perhaps he is saying, I can get the audience's attention too, bitch. First and foremost, he is letting Bob know that he has reclaimed the ring and that he understands what Bob's past and future crimes are. This confrontation prompts Leland to remember the past. But how do we explain the ring in Twin Peaks The Return? The only consistent thing about the ring in the 2017 series is that putting it on someone sends them to the Red Room upon their death. Did Lynch change the rules? Not exactly. In 1992, the audience for Fire Walk With Me was baffled, myself included. We incorrectly assume that wearing the ring transports you to the Red Room. Since Cooper represents us, he must also have the misapprehension that the ring works this way. So, he behaves this way, putting the ring on Mr. C in order to transport him there. Mr. C, as Cooper's doppelganger, must have the same misunderstanding. The thing is that everyone goes to the Red Room when they die, just as if a character dies, the actor playing that character must go backstage. There is nothing in the internal logic of Twin Peaks to dissuade Cooper or Mr. C of their belief. That's a complicated explanation, but there is at least one simple lesson we can take from this. Don't take the ring. Can we view Leland as a Jekyll and Hyde character? A nice guy who occasionally becomes a monster. Not really. He is Leland and not Bob when he has an affair with Teresa, torments Laura about her dirty fingernails, yells at the service station attendant, plots with Ben Horn, and murders Jacques Renault. It seems that Bob is like a gear, and when Leland's evil reaches a certain point, he goes into Bob gear. But that's not a very satisfactory answer. Leland's emotional state is very erratic and seemingly unpredictable. After he torments Laura about, in his mind, being dirty, we get this shot. Leland is angry. But he comes to some unknown internal epiphany, and he becomes very sad. He goes to Laura and offers her love. I love you. I love you so much. If Bob represents the desire of the audience to see exploitative violence, then perhaps Leland represents some aspect of the audience that has multiple motivations. He goes to Teresa when he wants erotica. He's a good father who laughs with his family when he wants a wholesome sitcom. That's my girls! That's my girls! <laughs> He gets angry if the daughter <laughs> He gets angry if the daughter character isn't clean. 
he sees a happy, wholesome relationship between Laura and Donna, and he has a happy, wholesome response. However, two women getting close to each other is at least a little erotic for most straight men in any context, and his thoughts turn back to prostitution. What makes Leland kill? Teresa sleeps with him, making her an erotic character, and then she blackmails him, making her a character in a thriller. It is a rational, although immoral, act to kill someone to prevent them from extorting you, and this makes so much sense on the literal level that maybe we don't want to look any further. But Teresa has changed the narrative in which she and Leland exist, so Bob takes over. Before killing Teresa, he destroys this television set. This box that gives him whatever kind of girl he wants is stopped working, so fuck it. Does Leland transform into Bob because he wants Laura to be the perfect chaste daughter, but she's a whore? Oh, if only it were that simple. Leland flies into a rage when he finds the necklace on Laura. Oh, look at this. Is it from a lover? Did you get this from your lover? They don't call them lovers in high school, Leland. No, but they call them that in TV shows. It is Leland, not Bob, that is enraged over Laura being dirty. Dirty means overly sexual in most English-speaking countries, and Leland follows Laura to confirm that she is with multiple men. Leland, not Bob, is enraged. However, for some reason, Leland decides that possession by Bob is the only way to control Laura. Either that, or Leland's rage allows Bob to control him and use Leland to execute his established plan to possess Laura. He says he wants to be me or he'll kill me. Then, in a masterpiece of circular logic, Laura chooses to be a murder victim and Leland is forced to kill her. Don't make me do this! She is the murder victim because Bob kills her and Bob kills her because she is the murder victim. The third victim of Bob is Maddie. Maddie becomes a new surrogate daughter for Leland. We love you very much. I love you too. However, she is an identical cousin, not a twin. Maddie is 20 and Laura is 17. Maddie has a life all her own. I really feel like it's time for me to go off no. I've got my job, and my apartment, and I just miss having a life of my own. You have been such a wonderful help. Yes, but now she has to think about herself, honey. She's got her own life. She stops being a girl and becomes an independent woman, and Bob kills her. Bob kills women who change their character in relation to Leland. Nothing enrages Leland more than people not performing their part. Get back to your work! And Leland is used to getting what he wants. When he's a goofy dad, the whole family laughs with him. When he interrupts a serious meeting, singing and dancing, everyone stops what they're doing and sings and dances. If he does a weird dance, everyone does that dance. When he's happy, everyone's happy. When he's distressed, everyone's distressed. Leland controls the narrative. Leland represents audience members who are stubborn, myopic, who want very specific kinds of entertainment, and they get it. Also, Leland works for the Great Northern, which represents the TV studio. If we think of Leland as a television executive, then he represents the restrictive gatekeepers who keep television mediocre and predictable. Now we have laid down enough groundwork to reconcile the reading of Twin Peaks as symbolism with the reading of Twin Peaks as feminism. The women are essentially controlled by the men, as the characters in television conform to narrow ideas of femininity held by the mostly male producers, as many men view women in narrow ways. Laura cannot become a liberated woman. She cannot become an ass-kicking girl boss, but she can prompt the creation of a new kind of story that's poison to her abusers. It's not a happy ending, it's a dramatic one. If Laura's diary, which can be thought of as a record of the story, has something in it that Leland doesn't like, he tears out the pages, as if he can edit the story that he's in. Apparently he can. And these pages are for sure from Laura's diary. Yeah, these are three of the four pages that we saw were torn out, missing. And there's, there's still one missing. Remember, there is a missing page from the diary and a missing day from the timeline. The last seven days of Laura Palmer's life take place over eight days. Go ahead, watch Fire Walk with me. Watch the deleted scenes or read the shooting script. The day after Sunday, the 19th of February, is Tuesday, the 21st of February. Leland has removed a piece of the story. This is why Bob can take control of Leland. Leland is a control freak. Note that this works on multiple levels. If we assume that all of this drama is a parable about television, an audience member who doesn't get what he wants will give up on a show and switch to one with exploitative violence. But also, a realistic middle-aged man who obsesses about controlling his life and controlling the people in his life, especially the women, especially the young women, will descend into rage if things don't go his way. Ultimately, Leland becomes completely controlled by Bob. Bob's power is so great that the force of gravity is negligible. The control he wanted has now been completely surrendered to evil. Whether you interpret this as symbolism or not, it feels starkly real.
Having established that Laura developed diegetic awareness before she died, we need to ask ourselves the question of how is diegetic awareness related to the investigation? The most aware character in the diegesis is definitely Dale Cooper. In 2017, Tasha Robinson suggested something that now seems to be accepted Twin Peaks canon, that Dale Cooper represents the audience of Twin Peaks. All protagonists are mediators who help tell audiences how to interpret the narrative around them. But Dale Cooper is something else entirely. He is the audience stumbling through Lynch's obscure vision and mutating along with it. Robinson seems to think that this is her own interpretation and not Frost and Lynch's very specific intention. Robinson seems to be demonstrating an unnecessary humility that is rare in film analysts. Cooper definitely represents the audience, and that representation is intentional, consistent, and informative. It was two years later that Rossiter spelled out this reading of Cooper. The director of the show plays the director of the FBI because he gives his investigators mysteries to investigate. Dale Cooper was the one assigned to Twin Peaks, so he's the agent who most directly represents the audience that watches Twin Peaks. He is the literal embodiment of our detective intuition. He can feel the information we've gathered as viewers, just the same as our ability to witness his intuition through watching the show. This is why Cooper appears to have psychic powers. Cooper knows everything we know. It seems like a feat of superhuman deduction when he guesses that Truman is having an affair with Josie. So, Harry, how long have you been seeing her? How did you know? Body language? Yeah, this body language. We saw this earlier scene, so Cooper saw it, even though the actual Cooper wasn't there. The same is true for Cooper's truth bomb about Big Ed and Norma's affair. Big Ed, how long have you been in love with Norma? This intuition happens after we saw the seas with Big Ed and Norma. James, I'll get right to the point. I know you have the other half of Laura Palmer's necklace. I want it. Give it to me. How? Cooper is watching the show that he's in. When he sees Albert enter the sheriff's office, Cooper already knows he's there before anyone tells him. Sheriff, this is Lucy. Are Albert and his team here, Lucy? Yes. When we see Gordon Cole in the sheriff's office, Cooper knows he's there before he turns to see him. When he extracts the letter from Laura's fingernail, he has a magnifying glass that looks like a miniature TV screen a device that looks like a Watchman portable TV. If that sounds like a stretch, remember that Sam Stanley, in the film, found the letter under Teresa's finger with a 1970s portable film editor. Cooper assumes that the dwarf is giving him clues to the case. This is demonstrably untrue, but we, the audience, assumed it, so Cooper had to assume it as well. Throwing rocks at bottles is a completely pointless task, but Cooper thinks it will work, so we think it will work, therefore Cooper thinks it will work, therefore we think it will work. In this scene, Cooper is determining what suspects to focus on based on what we, the audience, are thinking. The events of the show so far, the first two and a half episodes, have given us no reason to suspect Josie, Shelley, James, Johnny, or Norma, so all misses. There's something shady about Jacoby, so The Rock nicks the bottle. Shelley is kind and helpless, so it would be absurd to suspect her, so on this throw something absurd happens. Oh. Leo Johnson could easily be the murderer, and the events of the show so far seem to implicate him, so Cooper breaks the bottle. Is this supposed to be evidence of Leo's guilt? If so, I'd love to be the public defender in Twin Peaks. Cooper is validating our preconceived notions. There is no investigative work happening at all here. When Lynch said that uncovering the identity of the killer wasn't the focus of the show, he was serious. In the pilot, when Cooper is interrogating Bobby, we know that Bobby didn't do it because, in murder mysteries, it's never the first guy. Therefore, Cooper knows it, and he confirms our feelings. He literally spells it out for us. But what about when Albert Rosenfield wants to destroy the body of Laura Palmer in order to advance the investigation? He is cast as the villain. Remember that Albert is an FBI agent, and therefore another audience surrogate. Cooper represents the audience as Lynch wishes them to exist, and Albert represents an aspect of the audience of which Lynch disapproves. Albert represents the viewer's desire for quick and easy answers. He is willing to destroy the body of Laura Palmer and thus destroy the mystery of Twin Peaks, but Cooper won't allow it. This is why Albert is so obnoxious. He is Lynch's exaggerated ideal of an inpatient TV viewer. The same device is used in the conception of Sam Stanley. What does the average everyday viewer do when they play detective and try to figure out what's going on in Twin Peaks? They might do like Sam Stanley does. Ignore the interesting things happening right in front of them, and instead sit there literally ascribing value to every last lamp, chair, and choice of wallpaper. I figure this whole office, furniture included, is worth $27,000. He is a parody of the obsessive Twin Peaks fan 
who has memorized every frame of the show, but has no idea what it's about, nor has any emotional connection to the work. Note that most of the breakthroughs in the case come from Albert. We follow Cooper, but Albert off screen is doing stuff that is actually useful to bringing Laura's killer to justice, and yet Albert is cast as the villain. Whatever transcendent mystery is at the heart of Twin Peaks, Albert isn't interested, so in Lynch's mind, he's a nasty guy. However, Lynch has a real affection for the grumpy Gusses who complain about the show while continuing to watch it. This is why Cole and Albert are close friends. Albert, sometimes I really worry about you. Why do the real-life Albert Rosenfields continue to watch Twin Peaks? Because, like all the fans, they have a genuine love for the characters. I love you, Sheriff Truman. Wanting to get to the end of the story in a hurry is bad behavior to Lynch. When Gordon Cole says this to Cooper, You remind me today of a small Mexican chihuahua. That's Lynch telling us that we need to chill out. In fact, every interaction Cole has with an FBI agent can be read as what Lynch wants to say to the audience. You think about that, Tammy. What about the other investigators? What can we determine about them? Well, let's look at the highest ranking law enforcement official outside of the FBI, Sheriff Truman. This exchange from the pilot is one of the most important clues in all of Twin Peaks, even though the first, less important half is most remembered. She's dead, wrapped in plastic. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on a second, Pete. Where? Where? He doesn't say who's dead. He doesn't say what are you talking about. If someone says she's dead and you say where, that means you were expecting someone to show up dead. Truman knows he's in a murder mystery. Hawk seems to be as sophisticated as Truman, and Andy, lacking diegetic awareness, appears to be a buffoon. Lucy, lacking diegetic awareness, cannot process that things are happening in front of the camera if she's not in the scene. So, telephones are a mystery to her. In the return, Lucy gains diegetic awareness, and now... Andy! I understand cellular phones now! So if these bozos aren't closing in on the killer, then why are we interested in them? Can we assume that there is some bigger mystery that is being investigated? Did Frost and Lynch intend to reveal the solution to the mystery in the TV series if it went right? Well, first, let's talk about how the series went wrong. As I have stated, Frost and Lynch did not want to reveal the killer, and ABC forced them to. You have to understand Lynch's state of mind to understand episode 15, Lonely Souls, which featured the reveal. Twin Peaks was an ongoing commentary on itself, this episode more than others. This shot of Gordon Cole saying goodbye to the investigators is an obvious meta-commentary on Lynch leaving the show. But let's look at the arrest of Ben Horn. This is an obvious fake-out, the sort of thing a traditional murder mystery would feature. If you don't have at least one red herring, your story will be five minutes long. But there's more to it. Ben controls the Great Northern Hotel, and as I stated earlier, the hotel represents the studio where Twin Peaks is being made. There are eyes everywhere. The eyes of the home audience watching the show, which would be visible if there was a live studio audience. If the Great Northern represents the studio, then Ben Horn represents the head of the studio. This is actually pretty obvious in retrospect. Horn is a cartoon villain, always chomping on a cigar, sometimes doing performances that are so big as to be vaudevillian. It shouldn't be surprising that Lynch would make the studio head into a broad villain. In the first season, Horn is plotting to destroy the Packard Sawmill for a development called Ghostwood. It may as well be called Evil Place. But why destroy the sawmill? Why, of all things, a sawmill? Because, well, what do they do in a sawmill? They saw logs. Sawing logs. Snoring. It's a dream. Horn wants to replace dreams with ghosts. Both are immaterial, but one is a metaphor for something good and the other bad. Ghostwood implies dead trees, and trees are a multi-layered metaphor for TV and Twin Peaks. Horn wants to make bad TV, work that is emotionally dead, in contrast to Lynch's emotionally vibrant, dreamlike work. During the first 15 episodes, Laura, the person, has come to be a metaphor for the emotional core of Twin Peaks, and this metaphor is solidified in The Return. Lynch believed that, by revealing the killer, and thus eliminating the mystery that was so exciting, that ABC destroyed the emotional core of the show. So, in a manner of speaking, Ben Horn did kill Laura Palmer. Obviously, he didn't literally kill Laura Palmer, but with so many layers of symbolism, a lot of facts of the Twin Peaks story can be bent into different meanings. And that's the problem. You cannot definitively identify a single person as the killer of Laura Palmer. Yes, Bob killed her, and if you really want to make an established character the killer, you just need to say that Bob possessed them. But that doesn't really move the story forward. Bob is supposed to be the avatar of exploitative TV violence. Laura was killed by violence itself, and Lynch associates premature closure of a story with violence. This is why Maddie is killed. 
Laura Palmer is being killed a second time because Twin Peaks has been killed. However, this episode demonstrates the absurdity of revealing the killer. Leland's culpability is ambiguous. Leland doesn't remember his ex as Bob. Bob was always intended to be the killer, and honestly, can we say for certain that Frost and Lynch always intended for an established character to be the murderer? In my research, I have encountered conflicting reports. It seems that when they created the pilot, they did not have a culprit in mind, but they decided it was going to be Leland when it went to series. Bob was created shortly after the pilot was shot to be an additional footage for the so-called international version. This version has a tacked on ending so that the pilot could be turned into a standalone film if the series didn't happen, exactly what happened over a decade later with Mulholland Drive. There's nothing to indicate that Bob was an inhabiting spirit in conception. Bob was the killer, end of story. Bob kills for fun as we watch violent TV for fun. The goal for Frost and Lynch was that an investigation into the life of Laura Palmer would make her more than a nameless victim, establishing that another named character killed her doesn't advance that goal. Think about it, what if they revealed that Shelley was the killer? Are we gonna find out this year who killed Laura Palmer? Yeah, it's, uh, it's Shelley the waitress. They could justify all sorts of inconsistencies by saying, oh, Shelley was possessed by Bob. That would be weird, but it would be slightly weirder than revealing that Leland is the killer. When they decided to make Leland the killer, I interpret this as Frost and Lynch creating an escape hatch. They had a logical culprit to reveal if they had to do it. We knew, but we didn't even hardly whisper it when we were working. It was out of our conscious mind. There is very little in the text to implicate Leland prior to episode 15. There are just as many clues pointing to Shelley. However, most abused kids are abused by a family member, usually the father. So there is a very good out-of-universe reason for this decision. In other words, Leland is the best choice if it has to be anybody, but the best choice is that it's nobody. Frost and Lynch wanted the viewers to investigate the murder of Laura Palmer, but not for the purpose of discovering the identity of the killer. This means that they wanted the viewer to uncover the nature of the murder or the nature of Laura. Murder mysteries rarely deal with the sorrow and emotional impact of a murder, but rather with the fun jigsaw puzzle of clues that lead to some kind of justice, even if that journey is ridiculous. The fingerprint that was made at Freddy's studio, it places you there on the night of his death. I've been to Freddy's many times. I'm not surprised you find my fingerprint there. That's not your fingerprint. That's the chimps. However, in Twin Peaks, we get hours and hours of the sadness, the crying, the pain. Maggie Mayfish contrasts the pain of the Palmers to that of Blake Carrington of Dynasty, a show that she considers the antithesis of Twin Peaks. Compare how the families in Dynasty and Twin Peaks react to the news that their daughter has died tragically. Everyone else is grieving, but he'd rather move on or, you know, try to put a positive spin on his daughter's death. This loss, this, this terrible loss, Maybe it'll help bring the rest of the family together. Most of the family gets over her death after a single commercial break. Leland Palmer reacts to Laura's death by losing his freaking mind. <laughs> and Sarah Palmer is a husk of a human. The excessive sorrow is meant to balance out the emotional void of television. We know that Frost and Lynch wanted a murder mystery that centered the victims and the emotions of the people she left behind. But why the surrealism as a means to this end? What does the fantastical, diegetic awareness trickery and the real honest emotions have to do with each other? Think about any well-written murder mystery. The revelation that brings the killer to justice comes with it revelations about why the murder took place and therefore revelations about the very nature of the characters, perhaps some underlying truth about the world of the story. The real reason that Laura dies is so that the TV show Twin Peaks can exist, and in-universe, this is also why she dies. That means that she died for our entertainment. So, in a way, we killed Laura Palmer. You damn hypocrites make me sick! Everybody knew she was in trouble. But we didn't do anything. You want to know who killed Laura? You did! We all did. And pretty words aren't going to bring her back, man, so save your prayers. She would have laughed at them anyway. The point is that the reflexivity of Twin Peaks isn't just a gimmick. Lynch is saying that the fictional worlds and the real world are interconnected. We get desensitized to violence from the media and we don't take it seriously in real life. We see women treated like objects on TV and we feel better about mistreating real women. This is why Lynch likes to keep the line between fantasy and reality permeable, because he believes that our stories mold our actions. So the revelation at the end of Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, that Laura knows she's a fictional character, might be the ending that Frost and Lynch wanted for the series. Looking at the first 15 episodes, we are uncovering the facts about her murder and all of those facts are confirmed in the movie. 
However, the movie bombed, and there's little reason to believe that if this same twist ending had happened in the show, that it would have been well received. The fact is that most people don't like surrealism. I'm not a snob. I know why Lynch's work is so alienating. I also know why Lynch's work achieves popularity when it does. Twin Peaks was popular because it was different. It was quirky. It was fun. In 1990, audiences thought that the reveal of the killer was going to be different, quirky, and fun. When it wasn't, Twin Peaks died. There seems to be a split in the Twin Peaks fan community. Some people want to think of it as a puzzle, and some people like to think of it as an emotional experience. They are both right. For Lynch, cinema must draw on his deep personal emotions, and therefore his films are cryptic, since no one can know David Lynch except for David Lynch. However, his films are an honest portrayal of his feelings, and that's why there's always a strict logic to these worlds, no matter how cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs the story becomes. Lynch started with the truth of abused young girls in America, ran it through a sort of lynch of fire and it came out as Twin Peaks, a story that's very real if you selectively ignore a lot of the fantastical elements, but is distinct from other similar stories because of the fantastical elements. It's very difficult to land on a single lesson from Twin Peaks, at least nothing that can be attributed to Frost or Lynch in any official way, and I try to avoid speculation with these essays. However, I will speculate that Lynch was trying to say something positive in spite of the dark material. Lynch forces us to understand that the way we punish people in America, retribution rather than restoration, looks a lot like a TV series where every week another evildoer goes to jail, but there's going to be a new murder next week, so what's the point? Occasionally the real Leland Palmers of the world face justice, but the next Laurel Palmer is just around the corner. I think Lynch would say that a better approach is to make a better society, a place where kind people take care of each other, and the light of investigation banishes the darkness of violence, a place like Twin Peaks. Thank you.